that introduction <coughs> from the husband of Francis Robertson. <laughs> That's the one I was going to preach. I told Jimmy tonight, you know, preachers are, uh, I've missed the Lord so many times, I don't like to talk about it, but I don't, I, when I preach, I don't want to miss God. I really, I have a desire not to miss the Lord. And there's a great responsibility in preaching uh, to a fellowship, any fellowship, but it seems like when men of God, like, are going to gather here, gather together, and saints of God, um, of the quality that's here, you know, they're just sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You just feel an awesome responsibility to make sure you preach what God wants you to preach. Say what God wants you to say. And you'd never really be able to sense that unless you stood behind this pulpit. And I do it in fear and trembling. I told Brother Jimmy, I, I really wasn't decided what I was going to preach till just about five minutes ago what I believe God wanted me to preach. And I said I was going to preach a message on discouragement. And Brother Jimmy leaned over to me and everybody was shouting and praising God. He said, great God, son, you blind. <laughs> he said, there ain't nobody in here discouraged tonight. He said, they may be tomorrow, but they're not tonight. Things I know is what they appear to be, amen? I remember my wife, I was in a revival meeting and Billy called me, or I called her late one night and she's reading a book called Strike the Original Match by a fellow named Chuck Swindoll out of California. And he was talking about the fact that things aren't what they always appear to be. Sometimes, you know, when you look at things, they're not really what they are. And he gave an illustration about a fellow who used to go to the opera all the time, and one day this gal stepped out onto the stage and she began to sing. And she had one of those mezzo-soprano voices, you know, that were just out of sight, just one of the most fantastic voices he'd ever heard. And he was way back in the back of the balcony, and I want you to know just because of the beauty of her voice, he fell in love with her. One night he got himself some binoculars and he began to see a little bit closer and noticed that she was a little bit older than he thought, but he still fell in love with her. And what caused him to fall in love with her was that great voice that she had. So finally, one evening after the opera was finished, he had an opportunity to meet her. And after they met, it seemed like it was love at first sight. They had a whirlwind relationship, courtship. In about four or five weeks, they got married. And uh, on the night of their honeymoon, after that whirlwind relationship, they stood in the bridal suite, and he stood by in amazement as he watched her plop out her glass eye and put it on a container on the table. Then she yanked off her wig, put it aside, pulled out her false teeth and put them in a container. <laughs> Finally she took off her glasses that hid the hearing aid she was wearing and then unstrapped her wooden leg and laid it aside. <laughs> Stunned and amazed, he looked at her and said, my gonna sing woman sing. <laughs> Things aren't always what they appear to be on the surface. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Kings in chapter 8. 1 Kings in chapter 8. How I appreciate it. I was back home this afternoon just resting for a minute. And I got to thinking how much I appreciate fellowship with the saints of God. 
You know, there was some folk over at the house last night, a little fellowship. We wished that we could have a big enough place to fit everybody over there. And as we were fellowshipping, and nobody's as witty as Brother Jimmy and Brother Sonny when they get together. A few minutes ago when Fred led the singing, Sonny got his fingers stuck in his nose. I, you know, he missed his chick. And but nobody's as funny as Jimmy and Sonny when they sing, when they just uh, fellowship. And I went to bed last night thinking how grand it was to fellowship with the saints of God. How great it was just to love the brethren and dwell together in unity. What a pleasant thing that it was. And I want you to know, to me, even though I enjoy the preaching and I enjoy the Word of God uh, and I enjoy the singing, to me the sweetest thing that we have in these campgrounds as we meet together is the fellowship we have with each other. It's just a foretaste of glory divine. It's just a little example of what it's going to be like with the Lord Jesus Christ one day. Here's a message in 1 Kings chapter 8 that I want to share with you tonight. It's one that maybe some of you have heard me preach before, but it's a message that God gave me several months ago at a time of darkness and despair in my own life, a time of despondency in my own life. And this message, though it's a grand old truth, God the Holy Ghost began to reveal it to me in a brand new way that ministered to my heart. It's one of those truths that you know, but all of a sudden God shows it to you in a different light. God shows it to you in a different way, and it means more to you then than it's ever meant before. I remember when Ron Dunn came at our last Bible conference, the first message he preached is, was that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And after the message that night, I got up and I was weeping and I said, Brother Ron, that's the greatest message I've ever heard in my life. And I was thinking about it and I said, well, really, I guess the greatness of the message depends on the greatness of the need. The message was very great because my need was very great. And in a dark hour and a time of great despair and despondency, personally in my own life, the Spirit of God showed me this message and it was an encouragement and has been, yea, to this day to my heart. And I want to share it with you tonight. And so if you'll stand together, please. In 1 Kings in chapter 8, we'll read from verse 12 through verse 18. Now the scene here is simply the dedicating of the temple that was built by Solomon. And the ark is being brought into the temple and the dedication ceremony is about to unfold. Verse 12 says, Then spake Solomon, The Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built thee in the house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which spake with his mouth unto David my father, and hath with his hand fulfilled it, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house that my name might be therein. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. And it was in the heart of David my father to build an house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord said unto David my father, Whereas it was in thine heart to build a house unto my name, thou didst well that it was in thine heart. And the message that I want to bring tonight is a message I is simply entitled The Successful Failure. God's Successful Failures. And the portion of Scripture we want to zero in on is verse 18, When the Lord said unto David my father, Whereas it was in thine heart to build a house unto my name, thou didst well that it was in thine heart. And before some of you judge the message tonight, I pray that you'll listen to all the message. And before we pray, I want to ask you one question. 
What is in your heart tonight to do unto Jesus? What is in your heart tonight to do for Christ? What is it that's in your heart that maybe nobody else knows about? The dearest dreams, the greatest longings of your heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. What is it tonight? Our Father, we thank Thee. Our Father, we bless Thee and praise Thee for the Word of God. And I want to praise You for the saints of God who are so generous, blessed Father, with their encouragement, so generous, blessed Father, with their attentiveness. Blessed Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that the Holy Spirit will minister to our individual needs tonight. And in a dark hour, seemingly in the world, when people all around are being discouraged, I pray in Jesus' name you'll encourage us tonight in the work of the Lord. And that we'll not be weary in well-doing because we know that in due season we'll reap if we faint not. Father, minister to our needs. Speak to our hearts. Help us and encourage us tonight. And for that which you do, we'll bless you and praise you. And thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to use David, the king of Israel, as one of our primary illustrations tonight of a successful failure. For many times when the world says we failed, really sometimes then, in the economy of God, we are the greatest success. Many times when men mock and scoff and men will scorn at our lives and our ministries and that which we attempt to accomplish for the Lord Jesus Christ, many times God is placing His greatest stamp of approval in those hours upon our life and our ministry. David, the king of Israel, had ruled wisely. He had warred victoriously. He had sung songs that will live on in literary history forever. And yet, my beloved, his supreme hope was never realized. He went down to the grave, I believe, feeling like an absolute failure as a man of God. If you study the Word of God in the life of David, you'll find, I believe, that David had one great desire. David had one supreme ambition. David had one longing in his heart for the Lord his God and that was to someday build a temple under the Lord his God and a house where the name of the Lord his God could be glorified. But when David died, when David went down to the grave, the Lord for some reason never let David build that temple under God. And when David fell asleep one day, there was no temple upon Mount Moriah to catch the first kiss of the morning sun. The foundation had not even been laid. The temple had not even been built. And that had been David's dearest dream, his greatest desire, his fondest hope to accomplish something for God was to build that temple under the Lord. And praise God, the Word of God and even history books will reveal to you and I that when the Lord got ready to give a man the credit for building the temple of the Lord, he did not give the credit to Solomon. He gave the credit to David, the king of Israel. Solomon was the one who literally built the temple. But praise God, friend, our God doesn't see as the world sees. Our God doesn't judge as the world judges. And our God does not reward as this world rewards. You say to me, Brother Paul, how come God gave the credit to David? How come God didn't give the credit to Solomon? I'll tell you why. It's found right here in verse 18 when the Lord said, Whereas it was in the heart of David to build a house unto the Lord, thou didst well that it was in thine heart. What is it tonight that's in your heart to do for Christ? What is it tonight that's in your heart to do for God? Well, Scripture that's becoming so real to me is that man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks down at the heart. God sees, God rewards, God judges differently than this world does in this world system. You know what the world's philosophy is? It's this, bring home the bacon. Be number one, climb to the top. 
And I'll tell you what, dear friend, we have created in our churches around this country an unhealthy atmosphere of competition amongst the brethren in the house of God. We reward the biggest and the best. We reward the one with the most nickels and noses. And I'll tell you something, Fed, as faithful men of God and faithful women of God on the backside of the wilderness that nobody knows anything about but God. There's no little places and there's no little people in the economy of God and in the kingdom of God. I remember one time going over to Scotland a few years ago and when I came back through the Heathrow Airport in London, England, I saw a large sign that said this, 139 ways to succeed. Number one, deliver the goods. Number two, nothing else matters. That's what the world says. That's the philosophy of the world. I mean, climb to the top, get to the top, be the biggest, be the best. But I want you to know something, friend. That's not the way our God is. And like the brother said this morning, we need to have the mind of Christ. We need to think like Jesus and act like Jesus and see like Jesus and judge things like God judges things. Thank God this morning, our God does not judge us just for our achievings, but for our longings to achieve for the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't reward us just for what's in our hand, but He also rewards us for what's in our heart to do for the Lord Jesus Christ. David, the king of Israel, though he never saw that temple built, when God got ready to pass out the reward, when God got ready to give the credit, he said, whereas, David, it was in your heart to build a house under my name, thou didst well that it was in your heart. Hallelujah. Jesus said it this way. He that's first here may be last up there. He that's last down here may find himself first up there. Those down here that are praised and crowned and heralded by the crowds may find themselves unpraised, uncrowned, unheralded on life's other side. Though they may walk to the front of the ranks here, though they may walk to the front of the crowd here, though they may be highly esteemed of men on this side, I'll tell you, friend, God sees differently than the world. God judges differently than the world. And God rewards differently than this world does. I can see it all now. One day on life's other side, maybe a man like Billy Graham, who's a man of God, I believe, with all my heart, who preaches the Word of God, I believe, with all my heart, maybe though that man who's preached revivals all over the world, seen thousands, day hundreds of thousands, come to Christ. But it could be though you and I would put him to the front of the ring. It could be though you and I would esteem him higher than anybody else. It could be that you and I would say he's the best, he's the biggest. It could be on life's other side when we're standing in line. Jesus may say, uh, Mr. Graham, would you mind going back to the back of the line and getting that little old widow woman and bringing her up here to the front. Amen. Child of God, I want you to know something tonight. It's not just what's in your hand. It's what's in your heart that counts. It's not just our achievings that count. It's our longing to achieve for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure you've never heard of this person. His name was Georgie Howe. And Ian McLaren tells the beautiful story of Georgie Howe and how at the age of 37, he surrendered to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born in an obscure mountain village in Scotland. He was unknown and so was the village. And at the age of 37, at great sacrifice to his own self and to his wife and children, he surrendered to preach. And there he went to a famous university in preparation for entering into a pulpit ministry in that little old mountain village. 
After several years of labor, after several years of toil, at the sacrifice of his wife and children and himself, he didn't see them very much. And after several long years of sacrifice, he finally stood at the front of that university with his diploma in his hand, ready to go back to that mountain village to minister to those precious people, to break the bread of life, to share the word of God. But when I and McLaren went back to that mountain village, friend, he didn't go back to a pulpit ministry, but he went back to a sick bed and died three months later with tuberculosis. Never preached one message. Never prepared one sermon. Then there's a woman named June Nichols. She was a missionary on the East Coast back around 1935. And one June night, the Holy Ghost of God smote her heart and gave her a burden for the lost and perishing souls in Africa. All she could see was their darkened faces die and go into hell. And God broke her heart. And God broke her life. And God thrust her into that field of evangelism. There to evangelize that unknown territory in Africa. She went down there at the peril of her life. There she labored on that mission field in the depths of Africa. She prayed. She fasted. She passed out tracts. She witnessed for the Lord Jesus Christ and prayed and fasted some more. She poured her life into that area. Five years went by, no results. Seven years went by, no fruit. Ten years went by, no fruit. Twelve years went by, and no fruit. Not one person came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not one person was born again as a result of all her labor. Finally, she took ill, and she had to be sent home. And when her mom and dad picked her up in New York City, at the entering into the port where the ship came into the harbor, the gleam was gone from her eyes and the roses were gone from her cheeks and there she went into a hospital bed into isolation and died and never saw one of those heathens come to know Christ. I want to tell you about a third fella, third person. His name is Houston. I remember the first time I met Houston down Little Old Missionary Lions Church in Uvalde, Texas. I remember how that when I saw him, I could see that he was a boy afflicted with multiple sclerosis. He couldn't hold his head still. He couldn't very well walk. Couldn't hold his arms still. And yet one night, I preached a message on the glory of the Word of God. People came down to the altar of God and wept. And God dealt with our hearts about getting into His Word and obeying His Word. And that night Houston came. He waddled down the aisle. I'll never forget it. He waddled down that aisle. He couldn't hardly stand up. His head was a shaking. And when he got down front, he grabbed me by the necktie. He pulled me down. He said, Brother Paul, Brother Paul, I want to read the Bible, but I can't hold my head still, Brother Paul, to read the Bible. And he said, Brother Paul, God has called me to preach the gospel. My heart was smitten that night. I called my wife. I was broken. I was weeping. I said, Billy, get a tape recorder and the New and Old Testament on tape cassette and send it to this young lad. Praise God. When it arrived, his face was beaming. When he looked at it, he was leaping with joy. I'll tell you, he was thinking about that day. He'd stand in the pulpit and preach the glorious good news that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. I went home rejoicing. I went home praising God. But a few short months later, I got a phone call from his mom and dad. And the next time I went to Uvalde, Texas, I didn't go to the home to see Houston. I didn't go to the church to see Houston. But they took me to a little obscure graveside. And there was a marker where they buried that precious boy. Never preached one message. Never stood in the pulpit one time. Now I want to ask you a question this morning, friend. Tonight, do you believe the record of such heroic souls as these will go blank on life's other side? 
No! A thousand times I say no, for I dare to believe that they were veritable conquerors in the sight of Him who measures us not by the poor dross of our achievings, but by the fine goal of our longings for Jesus. One day when these stand before the Lord and they're credited with deeds never done and they're credited with souls never won and they're credited with sermons never preached. When they say to precious Jesus, Lord, we thought we'd fail. We thought we'd absolutely fail. When did we preach these sermons? When did we win these souls? When did we do these good deeds? And Jesus is going to look at them and say this. Whereas it was in your heart to preach. Thou didst well. It was in your heart. Whereas it was in your heart to win him to Jesus. Thou didst well. That it was in your heart. Whereas it was in your heart to do those good deeds. Thou didst well. That it was in your heart. Ha! Hallelujah. Amen. I've got some dear dreams in my heart. I've got some fond hopes in my heart. I've got some things in here that nobody else, not even my wife, knows about that I want to do for the Lord Jesus. So do you. We have dreams and desires and aspirations that nobody else knows about. Men and women, boys and girls alike, things that we would love to do for Jesus. And thank God, God's definition of success is different from the world. Thank God, thank God, sometimes, most of the time, we're successful failures. Thank God He measures us not just for what's in our hand, but what's in our heart. Not just for our achievings, but for our longings to achieve for the Lord Jesus Christ. But now I must hasten to ask you the second question. The first was, what is in your heart to do for Jesus? Lest we feel smug and flatter ourselves in our complacency, in our indifference, in our coldness, in our lethargy, I want to ask you, what is in your heart to do for Jesus? And then I want to say, there is a true test tonight of what's in our heart to do for Christ. There is a true measuring stick for every single one of us here of what's in our heart to do for Jesus. There is a gauge that God can use that can expose the rotten motives of our heart, the corrupt motives of our heart. There is a gauge that God can use to expose the purity also of our motives for Jesus. And it's the same for every single individual in here tonight. If this question, this next question were not asked, then I could go on and you could go on hiding behind our intentions and hiding behind our face and hiding behind what we say we'd like to do for Jesus. But God has a measuring stick. But God has a plumb line. He'll drop down to show us what's in our heart to do for Christ. It's simply this. The test tonight of what's in our heart to do for Jesus is simply this. What are you doing with what God's put in your hand? What are you doing with what God has given to you? Brother Sonny touched on it last night, and I mean he more than touched on it. He dug around it and dug in it and then blew it up. And you know what he was saying to me last night when he was preaching? Jesus called some people wicked in the New Testament. But you know what? It amazed me who Jesus called wicked. You know, there's not but one time in the New Testament that I can see that Christ called anybody wicked. And it may do us well to find out just who Jesus Christ turns tonight as a wicked person. Was it the harlot Jesus called wicked? It wasn't the drunkard that Jesus called wicked. 
It wasn't the dope crowd that Jesus called wicked. It wasn't the Pharisees that Jesus called wicked. Do you know who the Lord Jesus Christ called wicked? It was one of His very own servants that took the talent that Christ had given to them and went out and buried it and did absolutely nothing with it at all. Jesus said, Thou art a wicked servant. We can sit here tonight and say, this is in my heart, and that is in my heart for Christ. Fine, great, but what are you doing with what Christ has placed in your hand? You see, a loving Heavenly Father does not demand more out of us than that which He has given to us. He does not demand of you and I that we be like somebody else, but only that we be what we are in the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in the light as He's in the light. Thank God he's not a cruel, hard taskmaster. One day, there was a little widow woman. She had two mites. She went to the house of God. And there the Lord Jesus Christ stood by a pillar and observed the transaction that took place. First of all, he saw three men go in, apparently of great stature and wealth. And they walked into the house of God up to the treasury and the Bible says they cast in out of their abundance. No doubt these men put in a thousand dollars apiece. No doubt these men put in a great sum for their time. And when they left the temple, Jesus watched a little widow woman with two mites. She walked up to the treasury. She took those two mites and she threw them into the treasury. And the Lord Jesus Christ said this. He said, I want you disciples to know one thing. That this little widow woman that's put in two mites, she's put in then more than all these men put together. Hallelujah. You say, Brother Paul, did she literally put in more? No, but in the economy of God, she put in more. In the economy of man, she, she, they put in more. But in the economy of God, she's the one that put the most in. She came that day. She said, Lord Jesus, I don't have much in my hand, but I got a whole lot in my heart. And to prove it to you, I'm giving you all I got in my hand. Hallelujah. God sees differently than the world. God judges differently than the world. God rewards differently than this world does. One day, on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, there was a man traveling and he fell upon thieves. Thieves fell upon him. They beat him up. They stole all they had, all he had, and they left him there for dead. That day, there were three men that walked by. Two of them walked by, looked at the man, bleeding, beaten. And I know in their mind, they thought, well, if we only had a course in first aid, we'd help him. If we only had an ambulance, we'd help him. If we only had the ability to fight off the thieves should they come back, we'd help him. But they turned aside and they did absolutely nothing. And when we read about their story today, we condemn them. But we do not condemn them for their lack of skill. We do not condemn them for their lack of ability. But we condemn them for their lack of heart. The fact remains, they did absolutely nothing to help this man in distress. And along came a third man. We call him the Good Samaritan. He stopped. He helped the man up. He carried the man to the inn. He didn't have, I'm sure, course in first aid. I'm sure he didn't have the ability to fight off the thieves should they come back. But friend, he got involved. He saw the need and he got involved. He said, Lord, listen, I'm going to help this man no matter what the cost is. Now listen to me, friend. If that fellow on the ground had a died when he was putting him on the mule to carry him to the inn, we'd still call that man the Good Samaritan. If he had died on the way to the inn, we'd still call him the 
Good Samaritan. If he'd have died two weeks later, we'd still call him the Good Samaritan. Why, you say, Brother Paul? I'll tell you why. Because it's not a matter of skill. It's not a matter of ability. It's a matter of heart tonight for Jesus. Some people say, if I could sing like the Calvary singers, I'd sing. No, you wouldn't. If I could sing like Brother Sonny, I'd sing. No, you wouldn't. Friend, I want you to know something. If you won't take that which God has given to you and use it for the glory of God, you wouldn't do it, though you had a great voice. I hear people all around the country saying, Brother Paul, if I had great wealth, I'd give lots, you lying. Brother Paul, if I was a millionaire, I'd really give you lying. Friend, if you tight with little, you'd be tight with much. If you won't give when you don't have anything, you won't give when God lets you have much. Some people say if I could speak like an evangelist or a preacher, if I had eloquent speech, then I'd witness for Jesus. No, you wouldn't. If you won't take the mouth, God give you. If you won't take the ability, God give you. If you won't take the talent that God give you and use it to the glory of God, you wouldn't use it if you had 20 times as much. I remember reading a book written by Dr. James Alexander Stewart entitled, He Was a Stutterer. And Dr. Stewart talked about how that in Europe, he prayed that God give him an intercessor, somebody to intercede for him in prayer while he preached the Word of God. One day in a great tent meeting, a man walked up to Dr. Stewart one night, looked him in the eyeballs and said, Dr. Stewart? Dr. Stewart said, yes. He said, God sent me to pray for you. Well, what do you mean pray for you? Be your intercessor. And Dr. Stewart said in his book, Oh my soul, Lord, it's the first time you missed it. Lord, did you miss it. Lord, I asked for somebody that could pray. This guy can't even hardly talk. Oh God, what are you doing to me anyway? Sending me this guy, he can't even get his words out. Dr. Stewart just kind of sloughed him off, put him off. And a few minutes and a few nights later, that man came back again and again and again, came up to Dr. Stewart. And finally on the last night, Dr. Stewart thought, well, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll just um, pray with him and that'll settle it. It'll be over. It'll be done. He'll realize he's not the man. And Dr. Stewart said as he came that night, uh, he took him into a back room and he said, well, okay, brother, let's go ahead and pray. And Dr. Stewart, by his own admission, got down and prayed some polite little religious prayer like we've all done it times to get folks off our back and he prayed some polite little religious prayer and then he said all of a sudden that fellow that was a stutter opened up his mouth and he said when he did he said the glory of God just came in that room he said he didn't miss one word he said his speech was so eloquent it just flowed out of him he said it was like hot just hot flashes just coming down through glory and he said God just filled that room with a cloud and he said about 20 minutes later he came to himself and the glory of God was in that room because when that man who was a stutterer prayed God honored it and God was in it and God came in a cloud that hour. I'm going to tell you why, friend, because that man was faithful to God with that which he had. Now you knock down what I'm telling you. God is not looking for success. God's looking for faithfulness. Amen. That's all God's concerned about tonight is you and I being faithful with that which Christ has given to us. Here's what Luke said in 16.10. He that is unjust or faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in the much. If you're unfaithful with little, you'd be unfaithful with much. If you're unfaithful with a little money, you'd be unfaithful with a lot of money. If you're unfaithful with a little talent, you'd be unfaithful with a lot of talent. I'll tell you, friend, I've seen singers with both vocal cords this long and that big around it couldn't sing for the glory of God it takes God on a man or a woman's life it takes the anointing of the Holy Ghost and faithfulness on their part faithfulness 
Are you being faithful? Are we being faithful with that which Christ hath committed to us? You know what, friend? That great truth ought to be a source of consolation to every one of us for two reasons. Number one, it puts us all in absolute equality. I mean, I mean, friend, listen. The man that's brilliant, no better chance than the one that's slow. The one that's rich, no better chance than the one that's poor. The one that's honored, no better chance than the one that's of no honor. The one that's highly esteemed has no better chance than the ones of low esteem. The one with five talents has no better chance than the one with one talent. It puts us all in the body of Christ in absolute equality. I want you to know we may not all have the same ministry and we may not all have the same manifestations in our ministry and we may not all be successful as the world judges success but I'll tell you one thing we can all be and that is faithful to God with that which he has committed to us. Faithful to God with our time. Faithful to God with our money. Faithful to God with our talents. Faithful to the Lord Jesus. As Brother Sonny so adequately said, there's no big eyes and little U's. He said, Brother Paul, I feel like I'm just a, a toe in the body of Christ. Well, glory to God, be a toe for Jesus. Heard about some eyeballs one time in the body of Christ. And all them toes was over a house having a prayer meeting. They were saying, praise God, I'm a toe for Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm a toe for Christ. Praise God. I'm right where I belong in the body of Christ, functioning just like God wants me to function. Glory to God. That night that eyeball knocked on the door. He said, listen, you bunch of toes. What you need to be is an eyeball. Them toes said, wait a minute, friend. God made me a toe, and that's what I want to be. What God made me. They said, man, listen, what you really need to be, though, is an eyeball. If you were an eyeball, you could see colors. If you were an eyeball, you could see people. If you were an eyeball, you could look all around. What you need to be is an eyeball. And them toes said, well, look, we, we just don't want to be. Ah, come on, everybody really wants to be an eyeball. You ain't doing nothing down there at the end of the foot for God. I mean, you're just a little toe. Come on, be an eyeball, be an eyeball, be an eyeball. So finally that bunch of toes said, well, Lord, we'll give it a try, okay. How do you get it? Well, I'll tell you what you do. Say hallelujah backwards 14 times, fast you can. Glory to God upside down 32 times. Fast you can, pull your ears out, let your tongue fall to the ground, you got it. So they give it a try. Say, God want to be an eyeball. God want to be an eyeball. God want to be an eyeball. And God said, okay, zap, you're an eyeball. But all you ever see the rest of your life is the inside of a sock. <laughs> Amen. You know why? Because you're a toe. <laughs> I want you to know something, child of God. It ought to make us content and satisfied to be a toe in the body of Christ if that's what Jesus made us. And we're all in absolute equality in the body of Christ. Amen. I want you to know something. I want you to listen to me. Amen. Not everybody knows aviolage, but I want you to listen. And I want you to listen carefully. You won't believe it when I say it. But A.V. Aldrich has as much opportunity to be a pleasure to God and to be fully rewarded as the Apostle Paul has. I want you to know Paul the Apostle is no higher than A.V. Aldridge in the body of Christ. 
I want you to know that, brother, that pastors down in Florida has just as much opportunity as an Apostle Paul, as a Peter, as a Savannah Roller, as a Martin Luther, as a John Calvin, as any of them. You say, but Brother Paul, look what they did for God. God don't look at just that. <laughs> Amen. I mean, a lot of works, friend, may just be a lot of wood, hay, and stubble. Amen. Amen. And I believe it's very possible at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ to have 95 stories of works and in a moment of time have a lifetime of Christian service and a lifetime of works burn up at the judgment seat of Christ with the fire of God because it's wood, hay, and stubble. And yet some pastor, some woman, some layman who's been obscure, who's never been heard of, has just taken that which God has given them and just been faithful. Just been faithful. And at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, you listen to that, we may be very surprised who gets the rewards. Now, I know we're not in competition, but God said there's rewards, and if there are some, I want some. If you don't want yours, tell God to give them to me. It puts us all in absolute equality. And number two, it ought to be a source of great blessing to us because it puts the highest possible victory in reach of every one of us. I don't know about you, friend, but to me, the highest possible victory is one day on life's other side when I meet the precious Savior. It's for him to say to me, Well done, thou good and successful servant. No? Oh, let's see. Well done, thou good and preacher evangelist who left his family 30 weeks a year to preach revival meetings. Servant. No? Well done, thou good and big giver. Servant. No. Well done, thou good and deacon. Servant. No. Well done, thou good and praised by all the people in Texas. Evangelism Conference. Servant. No. Well done, thou good and pastor of a big church, a lot of nickels and noses, outreach programs, servant. No. I'm trying to tell you something. Well done, thou good and servant. My dear brother and my dear sister, the thing that has warmed my heart, I, 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 listen, I've laid in these motel rooms and I've wept, and I've bawled, and I've looked at what other men are doing for God, and I've measured my life, tried to, and tried to measure my ministry, and tried to measure myself by the work that they were doing for God. And I'm not saying their work hasn't been genuine and hasn't been real and wasn't ordained of God, and I, but I've tried myself. Have you ever done that? Have you, as a, I, I hate the term layman, but for lack of a better one, have you as a layman ever looked at preachers and looked at missionaries and looked at evangelists and looked at uh, deacons and looked at Sunday school teachers and tried to measure your life by them? Heirs and felt like you'd just come out in the pits. I mean, I'd lay in those motel rooms and I'd weep and I'd bawl and I'd call Billy and I'd say, ooh, ooh. She'd say, just keep preaching. I'd say, ooh, nothing happening. She'd say, just keep preaching. I'd say, ooh, I don't have no TV ministry. Just keep preaching. Ooh, I can't even get a book out. Well, just keep preaching. Feeling sorry for myself, laying in the motel, judging my life by everybody else's life and work. Come up the short end of the stick every time. One night I was bawling and squalling, trying to read at the same time, and God said, Paul, I didn't call you to be anybody else but yourself. 
I didn't call you to any other work but that which I've given to you. And I don't expect you to function beyond the gifts and talents and abilities I've given you. And if you be faithful with what I've committed to you, you got a bigger chance as anybody else. Amen. Matter of fact, to whom much is given, much is required. And sometimes all them guys with all the talent, they get the most problems. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I like what Ron Dunn said one time. He said, some folk are lousy with talent. Some folks are lousy without it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> the highest possible victory in reach of everyone. Every child of God in the tonight can be faithful. I look at Brother Jimmy. Now listen, I'm not just saying this. I looked at Brother Harold today. I looked at the children's home as he was talking about little faith. I got the ideas making fun of all of us because he got big faith. And I look at all that's over there on those grounds and all that God's done. I mean, I get his newsletter and I'll tell you, I believe he loves God, walks in the light God gives him. And I, folk, you ought to go over there sometime. You want to be blessed. Then I look at here. I live right down the road. Once in a while I just come over here and drive around. You know what I see? A manifestation of a miracle of God because of a man named Jimmy Robinson that God used. You can back down, but I'm telling you, brother, I mean, they tell me that they used to, used to almost had to shut this place up one time. But there was a man that stood in the gap and was faithful to God. Look what God's done. Isn't it great? Amen. Aren't you glad he was faithful with where God put him? Then I look at Brother Sonny. Brother Sonny going to be going to Brazil shortly. Preached to 14 million people. I, I couldn't even look at 14 million people without going blind. Going to preach to 14 million people. God's given him outreach around the world. And you know, I find myself saying, ain't no sense me fooling them guys, man. They're just way, way above where I can never get. And God said, listen, son, I didn't call you to be Harold Brown, Sonny Holland, Jimmy Robinson. I called you to be Paul Seeker. I've given you a work. I've given you a ministry. And if it never takes on this kind of a manifestation, that's not the important thing. The important thing is you be faithful what I've given you to do. Hallelujah. Now, it may, but it may not. It puts us in all absolute equality. It puts the highest possible victory in reach of every one of us to hear Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Have you failed? And any of us in here haven't failed. Have you fallen short in your dearest dreams and desires? Have you come here tonight with a shattered fragments of broken and lost opportunities? You desire to do so much for Jesus, but somehow you just never seem to accomplish anything. I got good news for you tonight, friend. A venture for Christ can't fail. I mean, who judges the success or the failure of anything we do for Jesus? A venture for Christ motivated by the Holy Ghost of God cannot fail. If we triumph, we're victorious. If we lose, we're victorious. If we win, we're victorious. If we blunder, we're victorious. When motivated by the Holy Ghost of God, we're victorious and we triumph because a venture for the Lord Jesus Christ absolutely cannot fail in the economy of God. For God accomplishes exactly what He desires to accomplish through our faithfulness in this world. Exactly. And one day when we stand before the Lord and we'll say, Lord, when did we do it? When did we give that million? God says, when you give all that you had. When did we win that soul to your Lord? When you were faithful to tell them about Jesus. You didn't see the harvest, but you did tell them. When did we do that good work? Well, the Lord's going to say when you went out there and took what you had in your hand and was faithful with it, whereas it was in your heart to do it. And you proved it that way. Thou didst well that it was in thine heart. I close with this story. I remember reading about a young girl who was about 11 years old. She overheard a conversation from the doctor that her mother was going to die. And that little girl, like all young girls, loved her mother so deeply. 
She wanted to do something very special for her mother before her mother went on to be with the Lord. And so she knew her mother loved fine, dainty pastries. She didn't have any money to buy the pastries, but she did have a little china doll that her daddy had given to her that she valued and prized highly. And because she valued and prized it so highly, she believed it must have great worth and value to the druggist down at the local drugstore. And certainly, he'd exchange it for some pastries so she could give them to her mother. The next morning, she put that little china doll in a bag, headed down to the drugstore. And on the way to the drugstore, she tripped and fell. And the little doll broke inside the bag. She looked inside that little old bag with the fragments of that broken doll and the pain of a broken heart she went back up to her mother's bedroom holding that bag in her hand she stood before the bed of her mother weeping tears streaming down her cheeks and she said mama I love you so much I heard the other day that you're going to die and I wanted to do something special for you to show you how much I love you and I put this little doll in the bag to get some pastry to bring it home to you and I was going down to the store and I tripped and fell and it broke and mama I failed I failed and I want you to know that mama looked into the tear stained face of that little old precious girl and listen that failure of that little girl brought more joy to that mama's heart than all of her success could have ever brought you say why brother Paul I'll tell you why because she didn't look at what was in her hand she looked at what was in her heart Amen. and somehow I have an idea on life's other side my idea precious brother and sister in Christ the Lord Jesus who looks upon our heart man looks on the outward appearance God looks at our heart when we're faithful that which he's put in our hand whether it's little or whether it's much if we'll just be faithful of the Lord Jesus Christ one day all of our dearest dreams one day all of our greatest desires to do things for Jesus will be rewarded because he'll say you took what I put in your hand and used it for my glory faithfully and whereas it was in your heart to do whereas it was in your heart to go whereas it was in your heart to tell thou didst well that it was in thine heart I want you to know that truth has liberated me just to say I am that I am by the grace of God and I done threw away the script months ago that I tried to write for myself to live up to and I done threw away the script months ago that I, I, that I let other folk write for me and try to live up to. And what you see is what you get. If Jesus is pleased and you ain't, you got a problem. And that's, listen, and that's how all of us ought to live from victory to victory, from glory to glory. In just a moment, we're going to see a film. And this film is about what God has accomplished in birth out of Mildale Baptist Church, Mildale International Ministries. It's about the ministry, the main function of this church, evangelization. Brother Jimmy and Brother Sonny, who've been here probably longer than anybody else, used to tell me how the Dr. Stewart, Dr. James A. Stewart, modern-day missionary for God, came to these grounds years ago and how that God gave him a burden for missions now that burden carried over, I believe, to Sonny's heart. That's why Sonny has the burden he has, and to Jimmy's heart. And that's why Jimmy has the burden that he has. And I want you to know, folk, it's been miraculous what God has been able to accomplish through this ministry to touch and reach a lost and perishing world for Jesus. It's not because there's any millionaires. It's not because there's any great intellects. It's not because we have a church with 3,000 people but it's because of the faithfulness of the men and women of God. It's because of people like yourself that have caught a glimpse and got a burden and helped in the ministry that God has been able to accomplish through this ministry of evangelization what he's been able to accomplish. And as we've gathered here this week, I pray the Spirit of God has given us a new burden to be holy like Brother Jimmy preached today. A new burden to walk in the glory of God like Sonny preached this morning. A new glory to be everything that Jesus, a new burden to be everything that Jesus wants us to be. 
But while we're doing that, I want to quote one of my pastor's favorite scriptures. Eat the fat, drink the sweet. In other words, enjoy the things of God, but remember to send portions to them that have none. Amen. Nothing wrong with enjoying what God's given us. Nothing wrong with shouting praises to him, enjoying the singing and the preaching and the fellowship. Nothing wrong with eating the fat and drinking the sweet, but let's remember, even as we watch this film, to be faithful to send portions to them that have none.